Thank you very much to the committee uh, for this opportunity to present at this conference. And it's great to come together and discuss the how of doing fieldwork in Vietnam. So my presentation is really about the process of change, um, how I changed the plan for my doctoral research in Vietnam because of the pandemic. So I began my doctoral research looking at war memory in Vietnam in late 2019. Um, and my original plan was to conduct a year of research with curators who work in the War Remnants Museum, um, learning about the decision-making processes there, um, the processes they use to produce national narratives about Vietnam's wartime past. And um, I was able to come to Saigon in January last year to meet with the director and the staff. Um, and I made a research design that incorporated the ethnographic observations I made then, um, as well as conversations I had with what I call uh, memory entrepreneurs, so grab drivers, souvenir sellers who work around the museum. Um, that pre-COVID normality seems a very long time ago now. Um, and as is the case for probably most conference attendees, um, the resurgence of COVID-19 has really disrupted my research plans. So um, for me, this means that inside the war remnants museum. Oops. Um, so that's frustrating, but it does give me an opportunity to refocus um, my inquiry um, and move outside the four walls of uh, the museum field site. So this slide gives some detail on how I've changed my research design. Um, and this might be useful for others who are facing the same dilemma. So I don't, yeah. um, I don't have research results to, to show you right now, unlike some of the um, presentations we've had earlier. Um, I'm really talking about research that's yet to begin. Um, it's in the kind of replanning stage. So my original plan was to pursue uh, an institutional ethnography um, using the following anthropological methods. So to study the work of the curators, I plan to observe their routine curatorial work, conduct informal and semi-structured interviews and uh, longer life history interviews with at least five curators. And to study the organization, I was hoping to observe staff meetings, analyze documents relating to the museum's history and conduct semi-structured interviews with staff. And that museum also produced a book recently um, giving its own account of its own history since 1975. So from this slide, you can see that I'm now changing to incorporate a material culture focus uh, in the research. Um, that's to say, I now intend to engage in the study of objects and people's relations with them. So that's an approach um, commonly used in museum, in anthropological studies of museums and also of memory. And using that approach, um, I plan to study how objects that people keep in their homes um, or are significant to them trigger memories of um, and shape narratives around the past, including Vietnam's um, history of conflict, as um, every, you know, normal people understand them. So um, to change my plan, um, I basically drew upon other reading that I'd done during the first year of my PhD. Um, in the UK. So anyone who finds himself in the same situation, um, I suppose the right questions I've found to be asking are, what, what have I read? What other things have I read? What models are there out there that I could um, fruitfully apply to match the new reality? Because um, as many people here probably already know, doing field work in COVID times is really about being realistic and doing what is possible in the circumstances. So I only arrived in Saigon relatively recently, so I haven't started this field work. Um, and once hopefully COVID-19 restrictions ease up a bit and walking around the community and going into participant homes is possible, I plan to locate one particular hem alleyway and base my study there. Um, I have a, a few streets in mind from previous visits um, to the city and discussions with Vietnamese friends, uh, or if anyone attending here has any suggestions, then I'd be very pleased to hear them as well. So the new approach that I'm taking is inspired by two um, previous um, well-known ethnographies of people's homes that have been conducted over long periods of time. So these are the models that I'm planning to base my research on now. And the first of these is 
um, an ethnography called The Comfort of Things, uh, pictured here by the anthropologist Professor Daniel Miller. And over the course of 18 months, this anthropologist um, repeatedly went back to a South London street selected at random. And he was exploring people's relationships with material things um, as the means by which they express who they are, who they have become. So the way he structured his uh, output, his ethnography was 30 portraits that give rich detail of the lives of different people, the diverse people who participated in his study. And through these, um, he showed that social life is um, perhaps contrary to popular belief, not corrupted by materialism or made superficial and individualistic by too many consumer goods, that's misleading. He found that people's relationships with objects actually were central to their relationships with people. So their children, their brothers, their friends, their partners. But this, uh, this type of field work isn't easy to complete. So it's all about winning trust um, and winning enough trust from people to get them to let you in their homes for 18 months it takes time and patience. So it's not a quick, uh, a quick endeavor. And it also requires the researcher to think about their own preconceptions and try and leave these behind, try and have a liberal approach, um, an open mind and take people um, as you find them and let them emerge through what they decide to tell you. So another model here um, that I'm drawing on is Inga Daniel's ethnography called The Japanese House. Um, so this anthropologist uh, from the University of Oxford spent a year going to 30 families in the Kansai region of Japan to produce another anthropology of the everyday. Um, unlike Miller, uh, this anthropologist actually lived. So that means she got up, she ate with, she shopped with, she played games with, and watched TV with um, and slept on a tatami mat not too far from some of her research participants. So specifically five families who she repeatedly, um, five families who she stayed with for several weeks. And then there are also 25 other families that she repeatedly visited um, over the course of a year. And in this way, she was able to get very rich participant observation data. Um, she also used visual methods, um, and for example, she asked younger members of the household to just directly message her you know, photos of anything that they found interesting that day as a way to bypass um, household gatekeepers. So either the matriarch or the patriarch in the family. So there's room for creativity in this type of study as well. Um, and this type of immersion is arguably a bit harder to achieve than Daniel Miller's going into people's homes. Um, and it requires a significant degree of trust between the researcher and the participant. So this would only probably be an option in the later stages of my field work, um, if I replicate this in Vietnam. So like Inga Daniels, I already have six months experience living in the type of setting I'd be researching. So in my case, I live with a Vietnamese family in District 5 for six months in 2005. And I think they wouldn't mind having me back for a couple of weeks to stay, hopefully. Um, so if I proceed with this project, um, I would draw on ethnographic observations I made previously, um, as well as various ethnographic encounters I've had with, um, with Vietnam and Saigon since 2003. So part of the rationale for Daniel's study is that ethnographies inside people's homes have remained uncommon in the second half of the 20th century. So many people watching today are probably familiar with two texts by anthropologist Eric Harms that look at urban development around Saigon and Christina Schwenkel's recent book, Building Socialism, looking at the anthropological and architectural history of the city of Vin. Um, so urban development and housing much studied topics, but I'm not aware, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, of lot, any long-term ethnographies conducted inside participants' homes in Vietnam in general or in Saigon. Um, in particular. So this, I'm just going to talk briefly about museum anthropology and this organogram from the article that you've been circulated or you will be circulated um, by Sharon McDonald um, and others is supposed to capture the complex functioning of an institution. So um, it's hierarchies and decision making processes. And this one is about the Humboldt Forum in Germany. So that's a museum in the historic center of Berlin. 
So what this shows for me is that we as researchers can get sucked into um, the goings on and occurrences inside memory institutions like museums. And maybe that comes at the detriment of considering the wider context in which they operate. And um, as Foucault pointed out, museums are society. They shouldn't be treated as disconnected from it. Um, and in the field of museum ethnography, recent scholarship really emphasizes the need to move beyond thinking of museums as islands disconnected from wider society. So by moving beyond um, the conceptualization of museums as islands, um, by going to study memory in people's own homes, um, I think that that contributes to this wider understanding of museums. And I'd like to keep um, potential future work with the Royal Remnants Museum in reserve. Um, and there's potential maybe for the accounts of everyday memory that I might uncover through my research um, to be interesting to the museum and possibly to be able to go be returned into the inside of the museum. So um, we know from several recent studies, such as Margaret Bourdain's study of the Ethnology Museum in Hanoi and Graham Weir's studies of Da Nang and Hanoi museums that um, visitors to museums um, don't passively receive um, the information that they're given. And um, yes, so just to summarize, I don't view the changes I'm having to make to this research design as necessarily negative. So um, conducting an institutional ethnography of one museum is interesting, but what goes on outside the museum is just as important. Okay. So what's the overall point of the research? Um, so I've just briefly outlined here some areas of um, literature that I'm drawing on and hope to contribute to. And the first of these is the idea of epistemic, um, well, the idea of epistemic injustice centers on the idea that some truths are not heard, but they are silent. And Viet Tan Nguyen and others have highlighted how English language memories of the conflicts in Vietnam um, circulate on the most expensive circuits. So we don't know enough about how memory of conflict circulates in Vietnamese society today. And I hope in a small, modest way that this ethnography might help address this imbalance. Um, and I'm also planning to draw an anthropological approach to memory, such as those that can be found in the transitional justice literature. Um, I also hope to contribute to an emerging field of heritage and museum studies in Southeast Asia, um, such as Rachel Hu's study of the S21 Museum in the UK, um, recent studies of Vietnam's intangible heritage, and so on. So I hope to add to those with the study. And there's already a significant amount of research on alleyways in Asia. So looking at Hutong in Beijing and Shanghai and alleyways in Tokyo and Seoul and Bangkok as well. So in Saigon, existing research has looked at alleys in various ways as liminal spaces, looked at physical changes to these narrow spaces, so how they've been widened, modernized, civilized. Um, and I hope through my long-term ethnography, I'd be able to bring something different giving some rich de detail about the lives of the alley dwellers here. So I'll just briefly talk about the ethical considerations that I'm making when setting about this research. Um, there's a lot to talk about here and a lot that researchers should think about, um, especially from Euro-American institutions if they want to do research in Vietnam. So um, just one reflection that I've had on my own, who I am, who am I to do this research, is that when I was coming to Vietnam, uh, when I was younger, I was M and now I'm older, I'm in my mid thirties, so I've become G. So this is a kind of change in my position and my status relative to research participants. And when I came here last year, it was a bit of a shock to find out that, oh, Richard, I'm not M anymore. I'm not young, I'm not the young, young woman here <laughs> anymore. So. This is kind of something I've been thinking about. Who am I when I go to do the research? Um, you will have seen that I'm using anthropological methods, so ethnography. So I really hope to um, understand people's own reality from their perspective rather than try and impose uh, my own ideas. So um, I've designed the research to give as much voice to um, my research participants as possible. 
Um, and in this study, I'm going to be collaborating with Vietnamese researchers and hopefully we'll be able to publish together with them in future. And I hope that uh, this cooperation leads to long-term research collaboration. Um, and in the UK at the moment, researchers are thinking again about their institutions, such as uh, universities, and really thinking about their colonial roots and the whole idea of academic and anthropological knowledge production. So um, we need to make research less extractive. Um, so during the field work, I plan to share the transcripts of interviews or field notes if uh, participants would like to look at them. Um, and I'll offer to send final copies of my thesis um, to research participants, um, having got that translated um, in Vietnamese, into Vietnamese. Okay, <laughs> so this, uh, this slide is just, I suppose for me, this encapsulates the, the, the fact that as researchers, we are kind of researching reality. So, you know, COVID is, obviously something that's been with us for a while and will be with us for a while longer. So the situ this COVID situation will dictate the research for the, um, to some extent for the rest of the year that I'm here. Um, and it is a hard time to be doing anthropological research because of the face-to-face -face nature of that, um, that endeavor. So um, this is something that uh, we all have to work with um, and something that I'm not trying to fight, just to try and work in the parameters that I've got. Um, just here, I've put a few um, links to some existing uh, literature that's already been published about um, COVID-19 and the response here in Vietnam. Um, I think I'm thinking of this as this COVID pandemic is a once in a several hundred years event. Um, and anyone doing their research here during the pandemic um, has also alongside maybe their main project has the opportunity to, to record and publish their experiences too. So um, we can all see and hear and feel the changes in society around us at this time. So maybe one when one door closes on a certain part of your research, another one opens to document and reflect on this once in a lifetime period. Um, and because the anthropological research I'm doing doesn't take place in a bubble, um, this pandemic is going to impact the data I collect. Um, there will be limitations on what I can do. Um, and then maybe people, research participants might be reluctant to talk face to face, but I haven't found this too extreme in the first three months that I've been here. Um, so the first of these articles, some of you may have read these articles already. The first one was published quite early in the pandemic, looking at the government's quick response to the emerging situation. Um, and another of these takes an auto ethnographic approach. So the researcher just uses their own reflections and observations as the data and analyzes that in their article. So that's a way to continue your research at a time when meeting participants face-to-face -face might be really hard, or you might not get approval from your ethics committee or your health and safety committee. Um, and other articles have looked at how the pandemic has changed, how people relate to each other and their social relations. Okay, thank you. I hope I haven't run over time uh, too badly. Thank you very much for watching and bearing with me. Um, when I submitted this abstract, I had a different project in mind. Um, I still think it's helpful to talk about research ideas as they develop. Um, and I think um, we all agree Vietnam has so many possibilities for fascinating research, um, even if it takes us in a different direction to the one we expected. Um, so if you know anyone who might not mind a foreign researcher talking to them about their home, maybe let them know about me, I'd love to meet them. Um, and I'll just end by sharing some of the references that um, might be relevant to others watching. Thank you very much. That was a bit quick.